The other thing that I wanted to say is, uh, like, I, I just want to have a conversation. My, my prayer as we started singing, uh, like, halfway through that first song uh, has been, okay, uh, God, what was, what's on paper or what's on the iPad? Um, I just pray that the things that you want said are said this morning, uh, that you guide, that the, those main points uh, c- come alive and are, are heard this morning. Um, because I'm going to, I just want to have a conversation with you uh, this morning. It's a continuation of what we started talking about last week uh, when we started talking about the confessions of a fisherman and, and, and how we're all called to, to go fishing, to be fishermen. And, and last week, we, we, we put a couple of statements out before you because over the last half a century or so, there has been this, uh, re- there has been this new idea, right? It's not new, but we think it is, that churches should be missional. That, so now there's this, this uh, a whole designation of churches that are missional, that are going, uh, that are taking the gospel. And we talked about how that that's not new. <laughs> that, 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 that's nothing new. The, the very beginnings of the church were missional. And even before that, the, the, the people of God have always been missional. God has said over and over and over throughout history, go, image me, go, fill the earth, go, bless the earth because of me and through me. So being missional is not new, and in fact, uh, it shouldn't be used to describe a certain segment of churches. It is by definition what a church is, and that if a church is not missional in her efforts, then she really ceases to be a church. She's just a group of buddies hanging out together, uh, uh, having fellowship dinners or, or, or just singing songs that we like, that have a nice melody. If we're not missional, we're not a church church. And this week, I just want us to build on that a little bit. Uh, I want us to build on that, and uh, Scott's going to continue to build on that over the, the next couple of weeks as he takes you into Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and, and makes this, this idea of personal holiness, how each of us can be and should strive for holiness, not through our own efforts, but because of what God has done for us and continues to do through us through the work of his Holy Spirit. Uh, but today, I just want us... Uh, to, to, to focus more on the conversation that we started last week because, church, we have muddied things up. We have complicated things beyond anything that they should have been complicated. So I just want us to, to end up in a place today where we look at somebody's words, somebody that we should listen to's words on how we can simplify the mission of the church because the church over time across the globe and through the years has allowed herself to become fractured over a variety of reasons. I'm 49 years old, and for the most part, I have spent my life in two churches, uh, a church in Belpre and, and this church. And there's another couple that Shelby and I visited when we lived in the Cincinnati area, but for the most part, 49 years have been sent in, spent in two churches. And sadly, even in those two churches, you, you, you see this fracturing happen, where something happens and we decide that we can no longer play in the same sandbox together, so we split, and we divide, and we go different directions. And sadly, it's, it's not over a core truth that we find in this Bible. It's over something completely secondary or thirdary or fourthary uh, or whatever those second, third, and fourth things are. Those are new words for today. Uh, they'll be in the next edition of the dictionary. But we, we divide over all these side things, and it divides our focus and our power as we strive uh, to, to, to focus on what is essential for us. And, and we've seen that all throughout history, that the church has become uh, an, an instrument of division rather than the beacon of unity that she was designed to be. And I, my desire for this church, if I have an agenda, church, here it is that I don't care if this church is the, uh, is the most di- has the most dynamic worship team in the area. I don't care if we're the, 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 the most different church, the loudest church, uh, the, the most innovative church. I pray that we are the most obedient church that we can possibly be. Because if that's our, that's our responsibility. You've heard me say that time and time again. Our, respons- our, goal, our role is is to be obedient. That's our responsibility, is to be obedient. My words cannot save somebody. Your words cannot affect change in somebody. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Our role is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's working in us, to be mouthpieces for him. God does the work. Our role is obedience. 
So, so I, that's what I want up for this church is for us to be the most obedient group of believers on the planet. And if we are that, I believe God's going to take care of everything else, that he will increase, that he will strengthen, that he will grow. You see, because when we allow ourselves, our attention to be drawn different places, when our focus is diverted, our efforts are now distracted and diminished. And we, instead of having laser-like focus on Jesus, we start being consumed with everything else around. And I'm going to ask you the same thing that I've asked you in the past is before that you start looking across the aisle or, or looking across the room or looking across the road at another church to look inside, self-examine, not cross-examine somebody else. Self-examine your heart. Because in speaking for, uh, as, as Tony Foreman, like I, will st- I still proclaim I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I still spend time in God's Word, but is that changing my life? Now, I know that the pandemic has slowed some things down, has not allowed us to do some things like go and visit Scotland or go and visit Malawi, but when is the last time that you have been open to going someplace, to God leading you someplace, out of your comfort zone? that you don't want to go to, but when have you just made yourself available to that? When is, when is the last time that you've stepped out of your comfort zone and started a faith conversation with somebody you know needs to hear capital T truth? When's the last time even in your own home you had a tough conversation with somebody who, who, who needed to hear truth rather than what culture was screaming in their ears? When's the last time that you considered volunteering uh, for a special VBS or on mission? When's the last time you've considered joining one of the ministry teams around here? Wednesday evening, this past Wednesday evening, was fun. The parking lot was full, 80 kids or so downstairs. Uh, When's the last time you considered joining one of those mission teams? Guys, they need you. Gretchen and Katie are are, are stretching volunteers uh, in in multiple directions so that they can meet the needs of those kiddos. Do you need to make yourself available, open to the Spirit, maybe pulling you in uh, to to a ministry endeavor? Not just there. Maybe it's a prayer team. Gary Sampson is expanding our prayer team. And maybe it's taking communion to shut-ins. Where are you opening yourself up for in, in, in God's moving? Now, you could go in Scripture, you could almost take the New Testament and let it fall open. And the, on those pages would be words about how we can more passionately and more focused chase after the mission that God has placed on His people, on His church. You could go all over the place. You could, you could have read in Timothy about that. You could read for sure in the Gospels about that. You could word, read the words of Jesus, the words of, uh, of John, uh, the words of Peter. Today, I want us to focus in on uh, the the words of somebody that has a pretty good resume in this area, that that, that has has something to say, and we should listen to it. Now, if if I'm seeking out something, I want to go to the best. If you you want to learn how to play uh, keyboards, if you want to learn how to sing uh, on key, you are not coming to me. You're going to somebody that was probably on stage up here a little bit ago because I can help you not at all in those areas. If you're going to, if you want to shoot free throws better, you're going to find a coach that that has a history and a career of success in that area. If you want to be be good in business, if you're looking for success in business, you're going to seek out uh, trusted and proven business leaders. So in this area of our life, when we are seeking to simplify the mission of the church and the mission of the individual Christian, let's go to an expert in the area. Today, let's go to the Apostle Paul. Why should we listen to him? Well, because at one point in time, he was the chief divider of the people of God. 
He was committed because he thought he was doing God's work by persecuting the Christians, by, by hurting the Christian faith, trying to stand in its way. And then one day on a walk, he had a real encounter with Jesus Christ and changed his life forever. And he became a great unifier, taking all of these different people from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different um, um, governmental backgrounds, all of these different backgrounds, and bringing them together and uniting them under the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Romans chapter 13, he has some powerful words for us as we strive to simplify. And if you're anything like me, you like simple. That's uh, one of the reasons I became a math teacher. I knew that I wanted to go into education in some way, but if I was going to be like a, 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 an English teacher, a, a literature teacher, that entered into a realm that I didn't want to go to, go into, because if you're going to give a test in literature, you have to read a lot. So I might ask Joe a question, and, and, and I have to read a paragraph over Joe's understanding, and I have to muddle through, did he get the main points, did he, did he actually read what he was supposed to read, or is he just, he's just, he just making up a story? I like math, because when you're grading a test, if the answer key says four, test paper says four, move to the next question. If not, put an X in it, because it was simple. You knew when you had the right answer. Follow all the rules. Right answer. I like that as a rule follower. I like the, the follow the rules, get the right answer. I like simple. Paul at times can be very confusing. He, he like wrote the, the Christian tongue twister. I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do and the, 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 the stuff that I don't want to do is what I do. Uh, so at times Paul can be confusing, but here in Romans chapter 13, he boils it down for us. Remember, our mission as the people of God, as a person of God, is to make much of him, to share, uh, to, to go and to make disciples. Teaching, Paul here gives us all we need to know about this. Let's read uh, these verses together. And as I was studying this and reading and reading and reading, uh, I, I, re I, I read out of the ESV and NIV in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and I just loved the way that, she, that the HCSB flowed and spoke to me. So I want to read to you this morning uh, from that version of the Bible. Uh, and I encourage you later this afternoon, sometime this week, to go and to read a bigger section than just these few verses in, in Romans chapter 13. Read before, read after, because Paul's talking about a lot of stuff here, right? How we should live in society, and then we're right here where we uh, are going to read today, and then he talks about how to live uh, in, the, in the family of God. But it all boils down to one theme, one concept that's rooted here in these verses. So let's read this together. In, in verse number 8 of chapter 13, he says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery and do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever, whatever other commandment, all are summed up by this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. In verse 11, besides this, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the daylight is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires the Word of God from the Apostle Paul. Let's just take a look at some of the things that he said there. Uh, don't you like, like those, eight, those first few verses, 8 through 10, uh, are, are all to be boiled down to one word, love. You take all the commandments that God has given throughout time, boils down to love. L-O-V-E. Even back in the garden, 
It wasn't, that, it wasn't that God didn't want them to have that apple or that orange or whatever was on that tree that he said, you can eat from everything else except this one. It wasn't because he wanted to keep something from them. It's because he wanted them to love him and desire him more than they might desire this one thing that they cannot have. It was about love. As we see here, Paul pulls from the Ten Commandments, and he says all of those commands can be boiled down to love. The, the, the mission of the church is rooted in love, a, a God that so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. And that's the mission of the church is to put the people who need that salvation in contact with the one who can give them that salvation. It's rooted in love. Everything is boiled down to love. So we can almost forget about everything else around us and then focus down on that word, love. I go to work because I love my family. I, mean, I, I, I don't uh, cut Ohio drivers off when they're driving in the left lane for too long because I love my God and I love the safety of me and the Ohio driver, of which I am one, who cannot drive properly in the left-hand lane. I, 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 you, you wear yourself out because you love the person that you work for, that you, that you are married to, the, the children that you are raising you love. Everything that we do is rooted and should be rooted in love. Love does no wrong. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Man, I like it when it's simple. Easy? Mm. Simple? Yes. He, he goes on, he gives us a little bit more meat to go along with this. He says, Bes besides this, right, pay attention to what's going on around you. Right? You know the times. He's not talking here about a quantity of time because Jesus himself said, you don't know when I'm coming back. And that's not for you to know. So he's not talking about a certain quantity of time. He's talking about the quality of the time that we live in. And we could get weighed down in this. And I'll confess that I have been weighed down in this, especially recently, that we get so frustrated and worn out and bent out of shape because of the season that we live in, because of the unknowns that we have to deal with, because of the evil in the world that seems to be pushing us out. We can get weighed down in that. But listen to the words of Paul here. It is already the hour for you to wake up from your sleep. Paul's telling you to do something, to move. Yeah, you, you get the flavor. You know the feeling of the seasons that we're living in, so do something. And here's why you do something. Because our, our salvation is nearer now than it was when we first believed in Jesus. Now, you can take that to mean one of two things. Either one of them, I believe, is a good understanding of this. Either we are closer to death than we were when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, or we are closer to the return of Jesus than we were when we accepted Jesus Christ. Both of those understandings, I think, are true in this situation. We are nearer to heaven than we were when we accepted Christ. We are moving in that direction. And he says the night is nearly over. He's saying the night has had its day in the sun. Its time is over. The night and the stuff that happens in the night in Scripture is a time of secrecy and deception, of evil. And Paul is saying that time is nearly over may not seem like it. If we get so blinded and we put these blinders on that we can only see what's happening right in front of us, we may not get that sense because it's heavy right now. We're, you're, you're, we're dealing with stuff. We're dealing, we're dealing with work stuff. We're dealing with family stuff. We're dealing with health stuff. We're dealing with politics stuff. We're dealing with pandemic stuff. All this stuff just weighs us down, but Paul reminds us that the night is almost over. The day is coming. So in the night, live like it's daytime. And when you live, that, that when it says live like, live like it's light, that's like everything that you do. Live like everything that you do is in public for all to see, not in the secrecy of night where deception takes place, where evil takes place, where misdeeds take place. But church believers, live like you're living in the light all the time because the night is just about over. That, 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 that time is almost over. And how do we do that? 
by putting on the armor of light. What is the armor of light? Well, a couple things here that I think Paul uncovers for us. One, he's already talked about love. That has to be the vehicle that's driving everything that you do. But then he also says, uh, the armor of light, walk in decency. We should have that tattooed someplace on our body where we can see it all the time. Walk in decency. And when we get frustrated, when we get beaten down, when we're tired of just one more voice of confusion pouring into us, walk in decency. Walk in a way that makes much of our Father, that shows that our reliance is on Him and not all the garbage that's going on around us, not all the sickness that's trying to steal our joy, not all the confusion that's trying to, 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 to take away our focus on our Savior. Walk in decency. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This phrase, put on, it has sort of a locker room feel to it, in a good way. Right? When we talk about locker room humor sometimes, that's a, that goes a different direction. But when it says put on, it's like an athlete preparing for the competition that he's about to walk onto the field for. He's putting on the right shoes and the right equipment. You, you, are, you are getting yourself ready. You're going to wear the right stuff. The right stuff here is Jesus. Put on Jesus. You, you, you can read uh, other places, the, 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 the armor uh, of faith right? and, and all that goes. Put on Jesus. And I want you to look at, at what Paul gives us here. He gives us this wide range of things not to devote yourself to. And if we were in our humanness, if we were sort of putting parameters around that, it would go from the, the really, really wicked that we, that we denounce to the stuff that maybe we're guilty of and everything in between. He says, he says in there, he says, um, not carousing or, and drunkenness, not in, sexual impu- not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy. He starts with this uh, idea of, of orgies, uh, of, of sex misplaced and misused from public displays and drunkenness, which needs no explanation. And then it moves, sort of the same theme, but into a different realm, from the public into the private, dealing with private sexual sin. All right, so if we're being honest, this over here, this first thing, I hope that we're all like, that's bad. <laughs> Who could do that? Right? And here in the middle, that personal sexual sin, that <laughs> starts to involve a whole lot more of us. That stuff that we wrestle with that idea uh, of immorality, that idea uh, of provocativeness, promiscuity. And then he moves to something that if we're being honest, all of us deal with it sometime. That idea of jealousy, that idea of quarreling. <laughs> Paul's saying, yeah, right, you guys like to categorize things? So even if it's the worst thing you can categorize or something that you tend to rationalize, even whether it is sin, Paul's saying stay away from all of it. Instead, put on Jesus. Put him on. Cling to him. And what does that look like? I, I, I didn't count, but several times you read a four-letter word in here, love. It looks like love. Loving in a different way. The world has all kinds of definitions about love, Cling to the true definition of love that you see in Scripture, that you see exemplified in the way that Jesus died. Go to Philippians and read the kind of love that Jesus has, how he humbled himself, and that's what we're called to do, a humble love that is a powerful love because we're putting others before us. And that come, plays a vital role when we start talking about sharing and accomplishing the mission of the church, of making disciples, of teaching. So, so sort of to wrap all this up, I, I, I just want to, uh, to share uh, this with you, mainly because I just want to say this and see if I can say it out loud in public. I did pretty good over there. Now, if I could pull it off here, I, it's, it's like a, a, an A for the day, a check mark for the day, a star for the day. What you have in Romans chapter 13 is Paul giving us a Christological and an eschatological primer. I'm not going to say it again. That's as close as I get. Right? So it's this big idea. Right? Primer. All right, the, here's the basics. Right? Here are the basics of what you need to do to be focused on the end times. That's the eschatological, that the end times are coming. 
and the Christ, through a Christological view. We are looking to the future through the lens of Jesus Christ. That is it. And, and here's three truths, there are three facts that I want us just to, to, to take home and to, to rest on. First is this world will end and we do not know when. Jesus promised that. Uh, you, 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 why are you asking this? That's not for you to know. Your job is to go and do, go and make, go and share. Right? Live expectantly. Jesus himself said, I'm going to return uh, like a, 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 at the time that you least expect it, so be ready. That's why you've heard us say in some form or fashion to live with urgency like you truly believe that Jesus could return right now, but live with purpose just in case God decides to hold him back for a little bit longer. Live expectantly because we do not know when Jesus will call us home or will return for all of his church. So the first thing is this world will end. We don't know when, but when we do, when it does, there are only two directions, two options for your destination, heaven and hell. And because we are rooted in love, even the people that we don't care to spend too much time with, we would much more desire them to be in heaven with us than away from all that is good and holy in hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. So if we believe that there's only two destinations, it should dictate how we live our life on this planet. Because even if I don't like my neighbor, I don't want him to spend eternity away from God in torment. I can love him. And I love him enough to share Jesus with him. The, the second thing is that the only way to eternal life is through the gate that is Jesus Christ. We live in a time where, where we think that Jesus or the, the God, I'm sorry, is up on this mountaintop and that there's like seven different paths that you can take to get to the top of the mountain. And it's okay because regardless of which path you take, they all arrive at the same spot, so, so it's okay. No, that is fake news. That is false. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So there's only one way for us to get to God, only one way for us to get to eternal life in his presence, and that is through the gate. That is through Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in him? If you have not, you are wasting your efforts and you are jeopardizing your eternity. One way, and it's through Jesus Christ. The, the third fact is that the vehicle, the vehicle to this gate through this gate, that, that gate is uncompromised, passionate, and focused love. The only thing that kept Jesus hanging on that cross was love. It was not spikes in his hands and in his feet. It was love for you. And what compels us to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called is love. It's a love for Jesus and a love for the people that Jesus loves. Is the way that you are living your life today, is it opening doors into which an invitation for the gospel may be shared? Or is the way that you are living your life today slamming the door of salvation in people's face? The way that you handle high times, uh, good times in your life, the way that you handle bad times in your life, and everything in between, are you conducting yourself, your life, in such a way that you are opening the door for Jesus Christ? Uh, I, I have enjoyed, I, some of you may not know that I've started teaching some Bible classes at, at uh, Wood County Christian School. And I've enjoyed the first couple of weeks of that. And uh, it reminds me how much I miss the classroom. And uh, one of the things that I posed to a, one of the classes this past week is that, Patsy, if you are the only picture that somebody might have of Jesus Christ, what kind of picture do they have? Jeremiah, if you are the only picture that somebody has of Jesus Christ, what do they think of the Son of God? Now, we cannot do a lot of the things that Jesus did. <laughs> That's outside our realm of possibility. But man, we can love with the same type of love that he had. And Paul is telling us here that that is the key. 
Paul is telling us that we need to love ridiculously. That is the only way. If you, if you are living a life that is just beating people down, that is belittling people, that is erecting barriers in their life, that is making them feel like diminished and unimportant, uh, that, is not a, uh, that is not the type of uh, a relationship that's going to allow you to speak truth into somebody's life. It's not going to allow you to, to, I, to, to share with them Jesus Christ. Yeah, because when you try to, they're going to see Jesus Christ. If he's anything like you, I want nothing to do with him. Your, how you live your life is important, guys. Now, this whole short series was Confessions of a Fisherman. And we, we started last week and just sort of looked at some things about how all of us, because we are, uh, because we are Christians, we are fishermen. And we are a peculiar people, and we should be willing to do whatever we need to in order to do what God has called us to do, and that is fish. I just want to leave you with the words uh, from two guys robed in white robes in Acts chapter 1. Jesus had just left in this miraculous fashion. They had seen him uh, beaten. They had even taken part in denying him in his crucifixion. They had run to the tomb three days later to see it empty, and then he reappeared, and he spent 40 days with them, teaching them, loving them, spending time with them. And then here on this day, they just watched him go to heaven. That, that, that had to be something awesome to watch. So you can imagine, I mean, you're standing there, your, your hands in your pockets, in your mouth, your jaw on your chest, and you're just watching this in amazement. But then in Acts chapter 1, two men robed in white came up and say, men, brothers, why do you stand here watching? Go. Don't know when he's going to return, but he gave you some marching orders. Church, as fishermen, as believers, it's time for us to quit standing around, staring into eternity. It's time for us to start preparing and opening up the possibility of eternity with God for other people. Now is the time for us to fish. Now is the time for us to be, as Paul put it this morning, loving in such a way that, that, that we expect great things because night is almost over and we're going to walk into a glorious day.